Section 14 of Letters of Mrs. Adams, Volume 1, by Charles Francis Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sue Anderson. Section 14, The Letters, 1778-1779. To John Adams. Note, this is taken from a rough draft. The original letter, if it was ever sent, was probably captured by the enemy or sunk. It is without date, but the contents fix it in October 1778. This morning I received your very short letter. I determined to devote the day to writing to my friend, but I had only just breakfasted when I had a visit from Monsieur Riviere, an officer on board the Languedoc, who speaks English well, the captain of the Zara, and six or eight other officers from on board another ship. The first gentleman dined with me and spent the day, so that I had no opportunity of writing that day. The gentlemen officers have made me several visits, and I have dined twice on board at very elegant entertainments. Count de Stang has been exceedingly polite to me. Soon after he arrived here, I received a message from him requesting that I would meet him at Colonel Quincy's, as it was inconvenient leaving his ship for any long time. I waited upon him and was very politely received. Upon parting, he requested that the family would accompany me on board his ship and dine with him the next Thursday with any friends we chose to bring, and his barge should come for us. We went, according to the invitation, and were sumptuously entertained, with every delicacy that this country produces, and the addition of every foreign article that could render our feast splendid. Music and dancing for the young folks closed the day. The temperance of these gentlemen, the peaceable, quiet disposition both of officers and men, joined to many other virtues which they have exhibited during their continuance with us, are sufficient to make Europeans, and Americans too, blush at their own degeneracy of manners. Not one officer has been seen the least disguised with liquor since their arrival. Most that I have seen appear to be gentlemen of family and education. I have been the more desirous to take notice of them, as I cannot help saying that they have been neglected in the town of Boston. Generals Heath and Hancock have done their part, but very few, if any, private families have any acquaintance with them. Perhaps I feel more anxious to have them distinguished on account of the near and dear connections I have among them. It would gratify me much, if I had it in my power, to entertain every officer in the fleet. In the very few lines I have received from you, not the least mention is made that you have ever received a line from me. I have not been so parsimonious as my friend. Perhaps I am not so prudent, but I cannot take my pen with my heart overflowing and not give utterance to some of the abundance which is in it. Could you, after a thousand fears and anxieties, long expectation and painful suspense, be satisfied with my telling you that I was well, that I wished you were with me, that my daughter sent her duty, that I had ordered some articles for you, which I hoped would arrive, etc., etc. By heaven, if you could, you have changed hearts with some frozen Laplander, or made a voyage to a region that has chilled every drop of your blood. But I will restrain a pen already I fear too rash, nor shall it tell you how much I have suffered from this appearance of inattention." The articles sent by Captain Tucker have arrived safe, and will be of great service to me. Our money is very little better than blank paper. It takes forty dollars to purchase a barrel of cider, fifty pounds lawful for a hundred of sugar, and fifty dollars for a hundred of flour, four dollars per day for a laborer, and find him, which will amount to four more. You will see, by bills drawn before the date of this, that I had taken the method which I was happy in finding you had directed me to. 
I shall draw for the rest as I find my situation requires. No article that can be named, foreign or domestic, but what costs more than double in hard money what it once sold for. In one letter I have given you an account of our local situation, and of everything I thought you might wish to know. Four or five sheets of paper, written to you by the last mail, were destroyed when the vessel was taken. Duplicates are my aversion, though I believe I should set a value upon them, if I were to receive them, from a certain friend, a friend who never was deficient in testifying his regard and affection to his Portia. Note, it is proper to remark here that the inattention which called forth these complaints was only apparent and caused by the capture of nearly all the vessels which brought letters. Sunday evening, 27 December, 1778, to John Adams. How lonely are my days! How solitary are my nights! Secluded from all society but my two little boys and my domestics. By the mountains of snow which surround me, I could almost fancy myself in Greenland. We have had four of the coldest days I ever knew, and they were followed by the severest snowstorm I ever remember. The wind, blowing like a hurricane for fifteen or twenty hours, rendered it impossible for man or beast to live abroad, and has blocked up the roads so that they are impassable. A week ago I parted with my daughter, at the request of our Plymouth friends, to spend a month with them, so that I am solitary indeed. Can the best of friends recollect that, for fourteen years past, I have not spent a whole winter alone? Some part of the dismal season has heretofore been mitigated and softened, by the social converse and participation of the friend of my youth. How insupportable the idea that three thousand miles and the vast ocean now divide us, but divide only our persons, for the heart of my friend is in the bosom of his partner. More than half a score of years has so riveted it there that the fabric which contains it must crumble into dust ere the particles can be separated. For, in one fate, our hearts, our fortunes, and our beings blend. I cannot describe to you how much I was affected the other day with a Scotch song, which was sung to me by a young lady, in order to divert a melancholy hour. But it had quite a different effect, and the native simplicity of it had all the power of a well-wrought tragedy. When I could conquer my sensibility, I begged the song, and Master Charles has learned it, and consoles his mamma by singing it to her. I will enclose it to you. It has beauties in it to me, which an indifferent person would not feel, perhaps. His very foot has music in it as he comes up the stairs. How oft has my heart danced to the sound of that music! And shall I see his face again, and shall I hear him speak? Gracious heaven, hear and answer my daily petition by banishing all my grief. I am sometimes quite discouraged from writing. So many vessels are taken that there is little chance of a letter's reaching your hands. That I meet with so few returns is a circumstance that lies heavy at my heart. If this finds its way to you, it will go by the Alliance. By her I have written before. She has not yet sailed, and I love to amuse myself with my pen, and pour out some of the tender sentiments of a heart overflowing with affection, not for the eye of a cruel enemy, who no doubt would ridicule every humane and social sentiment, long ago grown callous to the finer sensibilities, but for the sympathetic heart that beats in unison with Portia's. 20 March, 1779, to John Adams, my dearest friend, your favor of December 9th came to hand this evening from Philadelphia. By the same post I received a letter from Mr. Lovell, 
transcribing some passages from one of the same date to him, and the only one, he says, which he has received since your absence, and his pocket-book proves that he has written eighteen different times. Yet possibly you have received a few from him. The watery world alone can boast of large packets received. A discouraging thought when I take my pen. Yet I will not be discouraged. I will persist in writing, though but one in ten should reach you. I have been impatient for an opportunity none having offered since January when the Alliance sailed, which, my presaging mind assures me, will arrive safe in France, and I hope will return as safely. Accept my thanks for the care you take of me in so kindly providing for me the articles you mention. Should they arrive safe, they will be a great assistance to me. The safest way you tell me of supplying my wants is by drafts, but I cannot get hard money for bills. You had as good tell me to procure diamonds for them, and when bills will fetch but five for one, hard money will exchange ten, which I think is very provoking, and I must give at the rate of ten and sometimes twenty for one for every article I purchase. I blush whilst I give you a price current, all butcher's meat from a dollar to eight shillings per pound, corn twenty-five dollars, rye thirty per bushel, flour fifty pounds per hundred, potatoes ten dollars per bushel, butter twelve shillings a pound, cheese eight, sugar twelve shillings a pound, molasses twelve dollars per gallon, labor six and eight dollars a day, a common cow, from sixty to seventy pounds, and all English goods in proportion. This is our present situation. It is a risk to send me anything across the water, I know. Yet if one in three arrives, I should be a gainer. I have studied and do study every method of economy in my power. Otherwise a mint of money would not support a family. I could not board our two sons under forty dollars per week apiece at a school. I therefore thought it most prudent to request Mr. Thaxter to look after them, giving him his board and the use of the office, which he readily accepted, and, having passed the winter with me, will continue through the summer, as I see no probability of the times speedily growing better. We have had much talk of peace, through the mediation of Spain, and great news from Spain, and a thousand reports as various as the persons who tell them. Yet I believe slowly, and rely more upon the information of my friend than on all the whole legion of stories which rise with the sun and set as soon. Respecting Georgia, note the descent of the British upon Georgia, other friends have written you, I shall add nothing of my own, but that I believe it will finally be a fortunate event to us. Our vessels have been fortunate in making prizes, though many were taken in the fall of the year. We have been greatly distressed for grain. I scarcely know the looks or taste of biscuit or flour for this four months, yet thousands have been much worse off, having no grain of any sort. The great commotion raised here by Mr. Dean has sunk into contempt for his character, and it would be better for him to leave a country which is now supposed to have been injured by him. His friends are silent, not knowing how to extricate him. It would be happy for him if he had the art himself. He most certainly had art enough in the beginning to blow up a flame and to set the whole continent in agitation. 23 April More than a month has passed away since writing the above, and no opportunity has yet offered of conveying you a line. Next to the pain of not receiving is that of not being able to send a token of remembrance and affection. You must excuse my not copying, as paper is ten dollars per choir. Last week a packet arrived from Brest, with dispatches for Congress, but no private letters. I was disappointed, but did not complain. 
you would have written, I know, had you supposed she was coming to Boston. By her we heard of the safe arrival of the Alliance in France, which gave me much pleasure. May she have as safe a return to us again. Last week arrived here the frigate Warren, after a successful cruise. She had been out about six weeks, in company with the Queen of France and the Ranger, Captain Jones. They fell in with, and captured, a fleet bound from New York to Georgia, consisting of Ship Jason, twenty guns and one hundred and fifty men, Ship Maria, sixteen guns, eighty-four men, having on board eighteen hundred barrels of flour, Private Schooner, Hiberian, eight guns and forty-five men, Briggs, Patriot, Prince Frederick, Bachelor John, and Schooner Chance, all of which are safe arrived, to the universal joy and satisfaction of every well-wisher of his country. The officers who were captured acknowledge that this loss will be severely felt by the enemy, and it is hoped that it will give General Lincoln important advantages over him in Georgia. Respecting domestic affairs, I shall do tolerably whilst my credit is well supported abroad, and my demands there shall be as small as possible, considering the state of things here. But I cannot purchase a bushel of grain under three hard dollars, though the scarcity of that article makes it dearer than other things. My pen is really so bad that I cannot add any further than that I am wholly yours. 8 June 1779 To John Adams My dearest friend, six months have already elapsed since I heard a syllable from you or my dear son, and five since I have had one single opportunity of conveying a line to you. Letters of various dates have lain months at the Navy Board, and a packet and frigate, both ready to sail at an hour's warning, have been months waiting the orders of Congress. They no doubt have their reasons, or ought to have, for detaining them. I must patiently wait their motions, however painful it is, and that it is so your own feelings will testify. Yet I know not but that you are less a sufferer than you would be to hear from us, to know our distresses, and yet be unable to relieve them. The universal cry for bread to a humane heart is painful beyond description, and the great price demanded and given for it verifies that pathetic passage of sacred writ, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Yet he who miraculously fed a multitude with five loaves and two fishes has graciously interposed in our favor, and delivered many of the enemy's supplies into our hands so that our distresses have been mitigated. I have been able as yet to supply my own family, sparingly, but at a price that would astonish you. Corn is sold at four dollars hard money per bushel, which is equal to eighty at the rate of exchange. Labor is at eight dollars per day, and in three weeks it will be twelve, tis probable, or it will be more stable than anything else. Goods of all kinds are at such a price that I hardly dare mention it. Linens are sold at twenty dollars per yard, the most ordinary sort of calicoes at thirty and forty, broadcloths at forty pounds per yard, West India goods full as high, molasses at twenty dollars per gallon, sugar four dollars per pound, bohe tea at forty dollars, and our own produce in proportion. Butcher's meat at six and eight shillings per pound. Board at fifty and sixty dollars per week, rates high. That I suppose you will rejoice at. So would I, did it remedy the evil. I pay five hundred dollars, and a new continental rate has just appeared, my proportion of which will be two hundred more. I have come to this determination to sell no more bills unless I can procure hard money for them, although I shall be obliged to allow a discount. If I sell for paper, I throw away more than half, so rapid is the depreciation. Nor do I know that it will be received long. 
I sold a bill to Blodgett at five for one, which was looked upon as high at that time. The week after I received it, two emissions were taken out of circulation, and the greater part of what I had proved to be of that sort, so that those to whom I was indebted are obliged to wait, and before it becomes due or is exchanged, it will be good for as much as it will fetch, which will be nothing if it goes on as it has done for this three months past. I will not tire your patience any longer. I have not drawn any further upon you. I mean to wait the return of the alliance, which with longing eyes I look for. God grant it may bring me comfortable tidings from my dear, dear friend, whose welfare is so essential to my happiness, that it is entwined around my heart, and cannot be impaired or separated from it without rending it asunder. In contemplation of my situation I am sometimes thrown into an agony of distress, distance, dangers, and, oh, I cannot name all the fears which sometimes oppress me and harrow up my soul. Yet must the common lot of man one day take place, whether we dwell in our own native land or are far distant from it. That we rest under the shadow of the Almighty is the consolation to which I resort, and find that comfort which the world cannot give. If he sees best to give me back my friend, or to preserve my life to him, it will be so. Our worthy friend Dr. Winthrop is numbered with the great congregation to the inexpressible loss of Harvard College. Let no weak drop be shed for him, the virgin in her bloom cut off, the joyous youth and darling child, these are the tombs that claim the tender tear and elegiac song. But Winthrop calls for other notes of gratulation high, that now he wanders through those endless worlds he hears so well described, and wandering talks and hymns their author with his glad compeers. The testimony he gave with his dying breath, in favor of revealed religion, does honor to his memory, and will endear it to every lover of virtue. I know not who will be found worthy to succeed him. Congress have not yet made any appointment of you to any other court. There appears a dilatoriness and indecision in their proceedings. I have in Mr. Lovell an attentive friend, who kindly informs me of everything which passes relative to you and your situation, and gives me extracts of your letters both to himself and others. I know you will be unhappy whenever it is not in your power to serve your country, and wish yourself at home where at least you might serve your family. I cannot say that I think our affairs go very well here. Our currency seems to be the source of all our evils. We cannot fill up our continental army by means of it. No bounty will prevail with them. What can be done with it? It will sink in less than a year. The advantage the enemy daily gains over us is owing to this. Most truly did you prophesy when you said that they would do all the mischief in their power with the forces they had here. My tenderest regards ever attend you in all places and situations. Ever, ever yours. 14 November, 1779, to John Adams. Note, Mr. Adams had returned from France in August, but was required by Congress again to embark at this time with powers to negotiate a peace with Great Britain. He took with him, upon this occasion, his two eldest sons. Dearest of friends, my habitation, how disconsolate it looks. My table, I sit down to it, but cannot swallow my food. Oh, why was I born with so much sensibility? And why, possessing it, have I so often been called to struggle with it? I wish to see you again. Were I sure you would not be gone, I could not withstand the temptation of coming to town, though my heart would suffer over again the cruel torture of separation." What a cordial to my dejected spirits were the few lines last night received. 
and does your heart forebode that we shall again be happy my hopes and fears rise alternately i cannot resign more than i do unless life itself were called for my dear sons i cannot think of them without a tear little do they know the feelings of a mother's heart may they be good and useful as their father then will they in some measure reward the anxiety of a mother my tenderest love to them remember me also to mr thaxter whose civilities and kindness i shall miss god almighty bless and protect my dearest friend and in his own time restore him to the affectionate bosom of portia End of section 14